So now we will move to a time of question and answer uh, with Dr. Tan and uh, Dr. Garcia Johnson and with Emily. And so I'm going to just kind of read through these and give you all kind of a chance to respond and engage as we go. Um, Dr. Tan, uh, this is a wonderful question. Um, would you share your experience with dreams and how the Holy Spirit might facilitate healing through the client or the therapist dreams for that matter? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. And sometimes people think that dreams are the province of the Freudian psychoanalyst or you know, psychodynamic therapist, but there are some books written by cognitive behavior therapists on the use of dreams in therapy. Um, of course, uh, those of us who take a slightly different view than the classic uh, psychoanalytic view will view dreams as just an, uh, another uh, source of data for us to consider what the client might be preoccupied with, might be thinking about, and so interpreting the dreams in the context of more uh, present contextual uh, 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 factors. Uh, so dreams are important, but I do not agree with Sigmund Freud that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. <laughs> Some psychiatrists will tell you, especially biologically, biologically uh, oriented psychiatrists, that dreams are just epiphenomena due to your brains cleaning themselves out at night when you're sleeping. So they may not be any particular meanings. I don't take that extreme view. Either. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. Dreams do have meaning. We must not overemphasize them. We must not underemphasize them. We uh, take dreams as data and we explore and we try to understand and exegete the dreams as best we can as the Holy Spirit guides us. So can the Holy Spirit speak through dreams? Yes. Does he speak through every dream? No. <laughs> so that's my balanced view on dreams. Use dreams, but don't uh, be completely controlled by them. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you. Um, this next question, I think, can be answered by probably all three of you in various ways. And I think Dr. Garcia Johnson, thank you so much again for bringing contextualization and, and, and turning the lens of theology back again to on our psychology and our presuppositions there. I think this question kind of grapples with that a little bit. The question is, how do you deal with Christian clients with impaired biblical understandings as part of their problem? There, clearly, there's an assumption underneath the question as well. So that's why I'd invite all three of you maybe to reflect on that. But let's begin with you, Dr. Tan. Okay, well, that's the crux of the uh, work of cognitive behavior therapists, especially cognitive therapists and Christian cognitive therapy to help identify, explore, and then restructure uh, unhelpful, dysfunctional thinking, and particularly unbiblical thinking. But as I said yesterday, I believe uh, we need to do this in a very uh, empathic, compassionate and with agape love in a way, with, in a loving way, with agape love. We must uh, be careful not to be uh, too harsh on the clients. And so we ask questions like, you know, uh, what's, what's the basis of what you're saying there? Is there another way of looking at it? You know, if that is true, what does it mean to you? Is that helpful to you? What do you think God has to say about this? What do you think the Bible has to say about this? And then you explore. And how about this verse? What do you think about this? Let me share this with you. Uh, how do you feel and think about this? So you're always collaborating with the client, being empathic with the client, pacing with the client, and showing a lot of caring and agape love or empathy and warmth uh, toward the client with compassion. But these things need to be dealt with. We need to speak the truth in love. But the truth is important. The truth is what will set you free. We still have to be very careful, though, how we exegete the truth and our uh, hermeneutics and so on. And that's where I, I think uh, Oscar's point is very important, that we contextualize this in a proper way. Because very often, we uh, assume the Western view of things. It is not always accurate, even in our theology. Well, I think uh, taking everything that uh, Dr. Tan has said, I would like to give probably... Uh, um, a kind of a complementary perspective. And one is the theological generosity. Instead of looking for lacks of God in the, in the human experience, I'm, I'm really interested in looking for God's activity in the, in the human experience. In that sense, I think we can have a better approach. I don't, I think it will be, uh, it would be theologically wrong to believe that God is not acting in the human experience uh, outside of our Western reading of the Bible, because the part of the whole issue here is how do I read the Bible, even as a, as a, as a, as a, theor as a therapist, as a counselor, as a preacher? I mean, it is my reading of the Bible, the reading of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, how much 
how much of God's knowledge there is in an individual, even if the individual or the person doesn't, cannot really um, uh, literally say, this is John 3.16. But how about if John 3.16's experience is in the person? How do we, how do we enable the person to see God's within it? Uh, her own or his own, you know, experience. So there is a la element, and I, for that, I would appeal to the Holy Spirit, which for me is the me is the meaning maker, is the internal translation of subjectivity and intersubjectivity and adjectivity. So there, there is a profound pneumatology here that we still need to explore, which I really am fascinated with the way I see Dr. Tan's um, kind of handling multiple worlds, and in practice, you're. I would say there is an intuition there. There is a mode of, of perceiving and discerning when you're under that guidance that enables you to move deep into the person's, uh, you know, um, uh, cognitive, you know, uh, perception of God. Even to say, I thought I was an atheist. Well, uh, that might be a category, but probably you're living more into, into God's uh, horizon than what you believe it is, the God's horizon. So I think that is... The way I, I see, I'm, I'm trying to look for God, not for, for, for the devil or for what the person doesn't have. We have a lot of that already. So I think we need another, another approach. Yeah. Emily, that, do you want to jump in on that? It reminds me of your response. You're muted. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think I ask myself this question often when I'm working with clients, especially when they believe things that are different than I believe about God. I have found that what's been important for me and my work with my clients is to ask the question, how do they see God? And then from there to ask, is what they see about God theologically wrong or is it just different from what I believe? I don't think that differences inhibit healing. I think there are places where healing can be enacted. And I think if, particularly if I'm working with clients who have a view of God that really is destructive for them. So maybe they believe that God hates them or God sees them as unlovable. My question in the room becomes, is there a way for me to enact the love of God with this person in a way that they can tangibly feel that then enables them to explore new theological possibilities? I don't think I can control what they believe about God, but I certainly believe that God is with us. And if possible, God can love through me. And that's mm -hmm. what my hope is with my clients. <laughs> yeah. Brett, I'm going to just quickly say amen to what Emily said. When I was working for three years at University Hospital, University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada, I had many uh, clients who came to see me in therapy at the hospital. At the end of six months or a year or whatever of cognitive behavior therapy, I asked them what has been helpful in the therapy. You know, expecting them to say this technique, the relaxation therapy, you help me to think differently. <laughs> Almost every one of them said, a bit to my embarrassment, you're the most loving doctor I've ever met, Dr. Tan. I'll <laughs> never forget that. So I said, well, thank you very much. Well, what else? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so we had the relaxation techniques too. But your love, agape, you see, that's the fruit of the spirit. The mm -hmm. power and presence of the spirit in and through you, flowing through you, touching the clients. You're not even aware of that. In fact, the more unselfconscious you are of that, the better. Mm -hmm. Too much self-awareness is no good. <laughs> self-awareness of the right kind is good, but we want to be unconsciously uh, you know, uh, aware of those things, that you just let the spirit flow in and through you so that you do it humbly and lovingly and compassionately. And that changes people's lives and their thinking more than all the direct cognitive restructuring techniques. Yes. So anyways, yeah, <laughs> there you are. That's great. That's great. Uh, I think this one is a helpful uh, one to talk about. We can talk a lot about what the spirit does. We're always wondering though, how, right? <laughs> how does it do it? So this question is, I struggle with depending on the spirit while not over, overly depending on my clinical training. I've seen many secular therapists who seem more effective than Christian therapists due to their clinical expertise. Um, could you speak to this? And, and that's a question for, I mean, how do we understand, again, that's kind of how do we understand the spirit working in the world, right? Yeah. I think like uh, I said earlier, uh, in Scott McKnight's book, uh, Open to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit transcends and transforms our human abilities. It does not work against them. Our human abilities, by the way, 
also given to us by God, <laughs> you know. And then he also, uh, you know, uh, empowers us with special spiritual gifts. But then he uses our abilities, our gifts. They're all from the Lord. They're all graceless from the Lord. So we use the best training we have as long as, and this is where the biblical guidance is important, as long as our techniques, our thinking, our approach does not contradict Scripture. So does not contradict agape love, does not contradict the moral and ethical guidelines of Scripture. We have to follow what the Lord has told us in Scripture, at least implicitly and quietly, if not explicitly. However, within that context, the Spirit works through you. So you just relax in the Lord, you pray, you submit to Him, and you use whatever skills and knowledge you have been trained in uh, as best you can to help the client. And you trust that the Lord will work with you and in you. But I think the intentionality and the prayerfulness are crucial, that we intentionally submit to the Lord. And we ask Him to help us. And we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. And then we go about doing our work. And then don't keep on worrying. Is this of the flesh? Is this of the Spirit? Don't be obsessive, compulsive about that. <laughs> Just trust the Lord as He flows in and through you. Otherwise, you, you, you end up as a therapist with another disorder. You know, a kind of a, a, a spiritual OCD, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Um, I think there is... a. Uh a particular obsession with uh, controlling knowledge and controlling the 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 role of the of the of the therapist counselor or pastor in how do i participate that i know is me and now uh, what's the what's the footprint that i'm making and all this there's the, there's this obsession in the west of uh, that is rooted in individualism that i think we need to be uh, aware of that's number one number two i think god is acting already so how do we how do we discern what God is doing, what the spirit is doing? Again, I'm trying to be consistent with my premise here. If God is already acting, if God, I mean, the spirit is the spirit of life. If we're talking about a God of grace that is generous, which um, whose ways are way beyond my own techniques and my own theology and my own experience of God, you know, how can I, how can I learn to trust God even when I'm not controlling the ABC of that trajectory, right? Abraham going to the mount, to the, you know, to moan to the with Isaac. I might not, Ray Anderson would say, I may not understand, but I have I have remembered how God has been with me, even when in, in contradiction and in paradox. So I think, I think at some point, even if I don't trust God. I might find God working with me and me working with God toward the healing uh, of a person. And that in a way will fulfill the very, the very aspect that Dr. Tan is talking is the character of God imprinted in the Bible and, you know, in ourselves. So I think it's, it's, it's healthier for me as a, as a, I would argue as a therapist, as a theologian to understand the complexities and the multiple ways God acts and say, okay, I'm, I might be able to discern this, but even if I don't understand the whole uh, spectrum, um, I think a sense of guidance, it's, it's helpful for me, but things are happening nonetheless, I would argue. Yeah, great. And Malia, do you have, yeah. Um, as Dr. Garcia Johnson was talking, I was thinking about uh, the Bruce text, I Vow, and in that kind of poetic text, uh, Buber argues that I thou moments are gifts that we experience, and sometimes we don't realize we don't realize they're happening until they're gone. And I think sometimes the work of the Spirit in psychotherapy is like that, and in daily life, we don't realize we're having this moment of God's presence, maybe until it's already passed. And in that way, I don't necessarily have to mechanize it, but I can just be watchful. Like Dr. Garcia Johnson was saying, like just watch and God is at work. And maybe sometimes we get to see that. And that in and of itself is a gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I may add that, what I think is when you become also a client of the spirit, <laughs> when you mm -hmm. watch and when you, is that, is that conversion from a therapist mm -hmm. and counselor into <laughs> somebody who's in Cognitive therapy, we call it in the philosophy, epistemic therapy. We're beginning <laughs> to know aspects of God that otherwise would be possible for us. And we're, and we're seeing that in the very interaction of something I cannot control and yet gives me meaning in life. Yeah, Brett, can I say two more quick things here? <clears throat> uh, number one, uh, despite all that we've said and it's all true, we still need to be very careful not to conclude then because we depend on the Holy Spirit 
we can be lazy and flaky. You know, we don't need to be trained. We don't need the techniques. The techniques are helpful. There are certain techniques in psychotherapy that are helpful. They've been validated and supported by research. We need to learn them well. And that's why we come to a place like Fulda and elsewhere. That's where you do the doctoral programs, you know. Although day counselors can be very effective too. But oftentimes they have some basic training. So we need to not be lazy and flaky. We uh, are conscientious with God's help, of course, with God's grace. We learn the techniques. But number two, that's important new ones. But under no illusion, it is us and our techniques that are primary. They're helpful. But the primary thing, again, is the Spirit's presence and His love and His power, His healing grace. So we are humble. You see, humility is crucial in doing good therapy and doing good integration. And I think, uh, Oscar, just to uh, uh, point out, the field of counseling and psychotherapy has changed somewhat in the last 10, 20 years, last couple of decades, in terms of many therapists in the narrative tradition, in marriage and family therapy and other uh, approaches, uh, are saying that the therapist is no longer the expert. They're moving beyond the Western view. The therapist is actually a humble uh, a collaborator with the client. The client is the expert. We let the client lead. But actually, from a Christian perspective, neither the counselor nor the client is the expert. <laughs> the Lord is the expert. <laughs> we all are his clients. We all humbly depend on him. And if I can take us sort of back, uh, Dr. Tan, it reminds me again of your work on intrapersonal integration yes. or personal mm-hmm. integration, how yes. important it is for us as the integrators, whatever yes. it is we're doing, right, vocationally, yes. we are integrators. And so the disciplines, again, community being contextualized in our particular yes. communities becomes yes. such an important source of, of, our, our, of our growth in the spirit, it would seem to me. Yes. Is that yes. fair to say? Amen. Yes, definitely. Therefore, it's not true that if you're a Christian and doing therapy, automatically you're doing Christian therapy. No, no, no. We've got to enter into those aspects of intentionality and prayerfulness and obedience by the Spirit, by God's grace, to become uh, integrative in that sense. I have to confess that through this, I've, I've listened to all the, the three presentations and the, uh, and one thing that it's coming to my, to my, to my head all the time, how the, the pastors and preachers need to become uh, you know, more therapeutic and how the, the, the counselors and therapists needs to become more exegetic, exegetics, uh, not just of, uh, of, of, of the text, but of the culture of, and of the human condition, widely speaking. So I cannot, uh, I cannot, uh, stress, um, how important is what you, Dr. Tana said that there is no excuse for not to prepare yourself. The mo- the better you prepare, the, the least, uh, of yourself will intervene in um, um, uh, obstructing the healing of a person. You need to Amen. know what are the A, B, yeah. and that means preparation. So I'm not advocating for the de- deprofessionalization. Probably the word is wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm saying the better you know yourself, know thyself, and God, the better you're going to cooperate and not interrupt a holistic yeah. healing. So. Yeah. Yeah, but Oscar, I want to affirm though your, your call, your implication, not to over-professionalize the field either. Over-professionalization is a danger and, and, and it is a, an error. See, lay counselors are very effective. They're not professionals, you know, because love, agape is the most important, powerful therapeutic force in the world. <laughs> then the techniques can help. You know? But so we, we have to be very careful, not just in the field of psychotherapy and counseling, in all of our fields. We can be arrogant and proud and over-professionalized and that will kill us. And pastors to making it an over-professionalization of the pastoral ministry. That is death, you know. And John Piper wrote a book called Brothers. Sorry about the sexist use of, of language there. But brothers, we are not professionals. You know, we are God's servants. And I think that's, that's, that's a very, very important thing to, to keep in mind. Pride, remember, my friends, is the worst of the seven deadly sins. Pride. <laughs> Well, I have the uh, unhappy um, job of bringing all this to an end. Uh, and I'm sorry that all the questions haven't been answered. Um, but I want to just again give a special thank you to Dr. Tan for these amazing three lectures. And today to Dr. Garcia Johnson and to Emily Noah for sharing with us today. We so appreciate it. <laughs>